Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon have invaded Judah. And they have taken with them back to Babylon 10,000 hostages. They're going to be exiles in a land that they never expected to visit. But now they're living in. They have become hostages to Babylon. And they have become those who will live far from their home country. Many of us have experienced Babylon. Now, let me say, Babylon was a real historical physical geographic location that these Jews were living in. However, I want you to also understand that Babylon has significant symbolic importance to us. Babylon can be that place where your hopes have evaporated and your dreams have died. Babylon can be that place where you find yourself that your biblical values are no longer honored and The God that you worship is mocked. Or it could be that the Babylon you're in is being under extreme pressure. And that's what we're going to see today in Daniel chapter 2. So if you'll turn with me there, we're going to continue our series from the book of Daniel. Because among those 10,000 hostages, there are 70 young boys who have been trained in the ways of Babylon. And among them are four in particular, Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, and Azariah. And we pick up their story in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, now you've got to understand that the way that they counted years among Babylonian kings, which is much different than we do, usually they excluded the first year. Now, I don't understand why, but I do know this, that that means that these boys have been in Babylon now for three years. They've been in training in the best Chaldean schools for three years. We read on, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. That word troubled is actually quite a profound word. It's the idea of a hammer hitting a bell. You are awakened from sleep. You are possibly in a cold sweat and trembling because you have had a dream that you know is not just a dream. I mean, all of us have dreams. Dreams go through our head. But then once in a while, you have a dream that can shake you. That's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has had. It has troubled him. Sleep has left him. He is not going to go back to sleep. It literally means his sleep was done. Maybe you've had that where you wake up in the night troubled, concerned, upset, and you know I'm not going to sleep the rest of the night. And if the king isn't going to sleep, ain't nobody going to sleep. Look at verse 2. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and they stood before the king. Babylon was the place that all dark, occult, All dark religion, pagan religion, arose from. It was an evil place. The Bible speaks of Babylon as evil. That's the kind of place that we're in. And so these are not quite the people you would expect. I want you to see the word astrologers. Maybe that doesn't bother you much. But they are those who determine things based on the stars. But more than that, the word also could indicate necromancers. They spoke to the dead. Then there's sorcerers, those who would take curses and spells from the darkness, and they would proclaim demonic spells over people's lives. The Chaldeans, they were a pagan priestly class. They were a bit of aristocrats there in Babylon. They actually had a great deal of authority under the king, and they were the people who worked in these dark magic powers. Verse 3. And the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. So again, it's more than a dream. Maybe you've had those. And God does speak to people through dreams. He even speaks to pagan kings. Verse 4, then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in the Aramaic. Now that's important, in Aramaic, because suddenly the book shifts. These next words, O king, live forever. You could put them 
long live the king. These words are actually Aramaic words. This book has been written in Hebrew up to this point, but suddenly it's shifting to Aramaic. It's believed Daniel is the author of this book. So the beginning words of it would have been written in Hebrew, but he also knew Aramaic. Aramaic actually was the lingua franca of that day. It was the business language. If you were to go between countries, you would use Aramaic. And suddenly the text shifts to Aramaic all the way until Daniel 7.28. There's a lot of thoughts on this. One thought is that this is the language of exile. Aramaic. That's what they suddenly had to speak, and they even take it back with them to the land of Judah. But also, now we're going to see prophecies about Gentile nations, and the attention is turning from Israel, not completely, but also to the nations of the world. Verse 4 goes on, tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. So basically they're saying, King, we're not mind readers. We don't know what you dreamed, but we are dream interpreters. And they're very confident because they had books in Chaldea that if you dream this, it means that. If you dream that, it means this. They knew exactly how to interpret dreams according to their occult spells and magic and astrology. Verse 5 goes on, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces. Your houses shall be made an ash heap. He's serious. He's not playing word games. He's not speaking in hyperbole. He was a man known to chop off the heads of his opponents. We know that when he went into Judah, he took all of the king's sons and killed them in front of the king and then plucked out his eyes so the image of his son's dying was the last thing he would see. He was a man known for roasting his enemies over a fire slowly. That's Nebuchadnezzar. You see, if you've ever studied business management, you know that there is a hands-on leadership style. There's a hands-off leadership style, but Nebuchadnezzar had a heads-off leadership style gives a whole new meaning to a severance package. But that was Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Let's go on and read in verse 6. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. This was sort of like an all or nothing deal. You're going to be given fame, you're going to be given money and rewards and wealth, or I'm going to kill you, one or the other. Verse 7, they answered. So the Chaldeans are under pressure here. They've got to answer. They've got to know what to say to the king. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll give its interpretation. The king answered in verse 8 and said, I know for certain that you would gain time. He's saying, you just want more time because you think I'll change my mind. But my mind's made up. It's your lives or it's the interpretation of the dream and what the dream actually was. Because you see that my decision is firm, if you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. Now, why is he so strong? Why is he so harsh? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. One thing, he inherited these people from his father. If you remember when he is going to Judah after having defeated Egypt, he receives news that his father has died. Well, now he's been the king for three years and he still has all these toadies and hangers on from his father's kingdom. And so these Chaldeans were people that his father very much believed in, but he's not sure he believes in them. He's not sure if they're even of any benefit to him. And so he doesn't trust them. He's saying, you can make up any kind of dream interpretation. If I really want to see that you're worth the investment I'm making, give me what the dream is or I'm going to kill you. Now that's pressure. They are under pressure. The Chaldeans, the magicians, and we're going to find out even Daniel and 
his companions are all under pressure. So what do you do under pressure? Here's how the Chaldeans respond. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. What they're saying is, we can't solve this problem. This is a ridiculous request. It's almost like they're blaming Nebuchadnezzar for making such a request. Nobody can do this. Have you ever been in a situation where it felt like nobody can fix this? There's nothing that can be done. I'm inept against this problem. I don't have the strength. I don't have the ingenuity. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the experience. I don't have the money. I don't have the capacity to handle this. That's the situation they're in. Verse 11. It's a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. The Babylonians were polytheists. So they said, even the gods, even the gods aren't going to help us here because the gods know things like this, but they don't dwell among flesh. They're not going to come down and give us the answer. You're asking something that only gods can handle. Now, the reality is if you give it a large G, a capital G, and you drop the S, you have it right. God knows the answer. God knows what the dream was. God gave the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. But they say he doesn't dwell among flesh. So what do you do when you're in a pressure situation? Obviously, the Chaldeans didn't handle it very well. How are we to handle it? Well, I want to give you five keys to handling pressure situations when you're in your own Babylon. And the first one is to know God is. God is. Again, except the gods whose dwelling is not among flesh. Folks, we know in John chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we drop down to verse 14, and it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We don't have a distant God like the Chaldeans did. We don't have a God who doesn't care about our dilemma or situation. We have a God that cares so much that he not only dwelt among flesh, he became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. And he lived the life that we couldn't live and he died the death that we deserved. That's how much he cares. We're not like the Chaldeans. We have a God who is. Our God exists. But it's more than our God exists. It's that our God is in our current situation. You know, we need to realize that. Not only that God is, but he is with us now. God is in our situation. God is active. God is involved. Now, here's the thing. When you're under pressure, when your world is falling apart, when you're in difficulty, it doesn't feel like God is. That's why David, when he was in that situation, in Psalm 27, Saul is breathing down his neck. Saul, the king, is wanting to kill him. And the armies of Israel are chasing him. He says in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, notice what David didn't say. He said, the Lord was my light before I got into the situation. He didn't say, the Lord will be my light as soon as I come out of it. He said, right now in the darkness, right now under pressure, right now when it looks like my world is falling apart, the Lord is. And that's the first thing we have to recognize. I know some people say, well, God hates me. God doesn't hate you. He loves you. Some people say, well, God doesn't care about me. God cares about you so much. He sent his son to die in your place. God is actively involved in your situation, whether you know it or not. The Lord is. The Lord is. He is in this situation involved. But the Chaldean magicians didn't know that. They didn't know this God. So they tell the king no, and they're going to learn something. You don't tell Nebuchadnezzar no. Look at verse 12. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Now, here's what we need to know. Daniel, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael have been in school for three years. 
They've been training. They've gotten their degree. They graduated at the top of the class. And they have been promoted. And they have been made the Chaldeans. They have been made among the Magi. They have a new job. The problem is the government is going to have some cuts. They're going to cut them to pieces. What a time to come into that position. So th this is a very stressful situation. Verse 13. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise man. They didn't mess around. I can just see it. I mean, immediately Nebuchadnezzar gives a command and those who are present are immediately killed. Thankfully, Daniel and his friends were down the totem pole a little bit. They were back at home. And so they're not killed immediately, but they're going out to kill people. And so it says, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, I want you to put yourself in Daniel's sandals. This is terrifying. Talk about pressure. I doubt any of us or very few of us have ever experienced anything of this magnitude in our life where people are hunting us down to kill us and the government has authorized it. Verse 14, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Notice with counsel and wisdom, Daniel had wisdom and counsel beyond his own ability. I want you to realize this boy and his companions are somewhere between 17 and 20 years old. And they have counsel and wisdom. We're going to find out they have great discretion as well. They have discretion, discernment, and tact, the Bible says. Now, that's extraordinary. You know, at my age, I feel like I have developed those things over time. And so I'll sometimes go into meetings with a great deal of assurance. I'll go in to meet with somebody who's not happy or somebody who doesn't like a current situation or somebody who's upset. And I'll feel like I can go in and I can handle this well. And I sit down and after just a few seconds, I realize I'm in over my head. Folks, we're so often in over our head. These young boys who do not have the experience many of us have, who do not have the knowledge many of us have handled this with absolute brilliance. And I want you to recognize how difficult this was. Notice this guy is called the king's guard. Literally, he was the chief executioner. That's his name. I mean, let me ask you, who becomes the chief executioner? I can just see this guy. He is a big ball of muscle. He has forearms like Popeye. He's got, I'd imagine, a shaved head. He's got a tattoo that says, executioner. He is, he is a violent man. He has an ax with blood dripping from the ax. This guy is not a guy you want to mess with. He may have a hood on with just slits for his eyes. And he comes to the door. How do you handle this? I, I can just imagine it. Antioch. Who? Antioch the executioner. Did you see the no soliciting sign? I, can't, I, I don't think that's how they handle it. But they handle it with tact and with discretion and with wisdom. And this is the second principle or the second key we need to know when we're under pressure in Babylon. And that is walk in the spirit. Paul says in Galatians 5.25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. What do we do when we're under that kind of pressure? Flip out emotionally, fall into paralysis or respond without even pausing? We shouldn't do any of those things. What men and women of the scripture did, and I'm sure what Daniel did, is wait on the Lord. Wait on God. In James 1, 19, we read, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I think the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit are those few seconds where you have a decision what I'm going to do. Am I going to depend on myself? Am I just going to react? Am I going to say something that just first comes to my mind? Or am I going to wait on the Lord? 
Am I going to consider what would God have me do? What is the Spirit telling me to do? How should I respond biblically? How should I respond as the Spirit is leading me in this? And this is particularly true when you're being criticized or you're feeling attacked or you're starting to get angry or you're feeling under pressure or your wife asks, does this clothing make me look fat? You've got to be very careful what you're going to say in that moment because it can determine your destiny. That is what people of the scripture have always done. Remember Jehoshaphat, enemy armies surrounding him. And he clearly says, I don't know what to do. I've been there so many times, but my eyes are on you. And he sets himself to seek the Lord along with all of Judah. Or I think of David, when his enemies have actually become those who are his friends. His friends have become his enemies. They're surrounding him and they're going to pick up stones to stone him. And David encouraged himself in the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll receive wisdom they couldn't have any other way. They'll have God's intervention in that moment. I want to encourage you. When you get in these pressure situations, stop and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Too often we act quicker than we need to. We need to stop We need to pause, we need to pray, we need to hear the voice of God. Verse 15, Daniel answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. This is amazing. This young man, no more than 20 years old, sets down with Arioch, the executioner, and has a civil discourse. He's discussing with him what's going on, what is happening. Explain this to me. That's extraordinary. There must have been something about Daniel. Verse 16, so Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. That is stunning. Because why was the king so furious with the Magi? He was so furious with them because they asked for time. And Daniel asked for time. And the king agrees to giving him time. What is that? It's called the favor of God. God will grant you favor when people will do for you what they never would do normally. It's it's the most extraordinary thing. And my entire Christian life, early on, I saw the scriptures and I read a little book about the favor of God. And I started praying for favor. There are scriptures that says that God will give us favor as a shield. He'll give us favor and good understanding in the sight of both God and man. I've claimed those passages so many times. I have prayed for favor nearly every day of my life, but I've learned something about favor. God gives you favor with who he wants you to have favor when you need the favor. He doesn't give you favor with everybody. Over time, I have been stunned how little favor I've had with some people and how much favor I've had with other people. And sometimes it simply doesn't make sense. It's because God is directing your life. He's guiding your steps. He's leading your way. And when you need favor, he'll give it to you. Don't expect everyone to favor. Don't expect the world to favor you unless God steps in and says, it's time for favor. It's time for me to give you my favor. And God gives Daniel incredible favor. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. Oh, I love it. I love this. Here is my third principle, and it's pregnant with all kinds of thoughts. Seek God and praise him for the answer. Now, it's going to take me a moment to unpack that. But I want you to see, what is the first thing Daniel does? He goes to his companions. Reminds me of Acts chapter 4 when all of these threats are made by the Sanhedrin and they return to their own company. You need an own company. You need a church. You need a church family. You need those who will encourage you and strengthen you in your faith and pray with you and care about your situation and know a little about you. You need that group of people. It's very important. We have someone in our life we're pouring into. We have somebody who's pouring into us. We have companions we can go to. And I want you to see what happens when they come together. They don't call themselves Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're called Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. 
because they're in private, not speaking to each other with their Chaldean pagan names, but they're giving each other their Hebrew God-focused, Yahweh-focused names. And that happens when you come together to the church. All week, you may hear yourself called all kinds of horrible names. But when you come into the church, we're to encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts. We are to speak to one another words of encouragement and strength, and this is who you are in Christ. We need to constantly be reminding ourselves of that. That's what these boys did. We need a company. We need a church. We need a people. We need a tribe. And if you haven't found that yet, you need to. Yesterday, I had this startling realization that I badly needed a haircut. And I hadn't gotten one because the man, actually he's a church member here, Frank, that has cut my hair for 15 years, was on vacation. So I decided I would just go to a neighborhood hair salon. So I go in, and uh, they have a list of people I can choose from to cut my hair. And I say, I just want the first available. Well, this young woman comes out and we begin to talk and she's very friendly. And she says, so what are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm a pastor and I am preparing for my message for this weekend. (gasps) She said, you're a pastor? She said, I just gave my life to Jesus. And I said, that's wonderful. She said, I'm a Christian now. So I said, what happened? She said, I was at the bottom. She said, my life was falling apart. These weren't her exact words, but she had been in an abusive relationship and was coming out of it. And she said, I just turned to the Lord. I said, do you have a church? Oh, no. Do you have Christian friends? Well, not really. And I'm finding out something, she said. Not everybody likes the idea that I've become a Christian. She said, some people don't like it at all, and some are antagonistic toward my faith. And I said, that's because you were going with the current of the world. Now you're going against the current of the world. I said, you need a church family. You need a church community. You need other believers. And of course, I invited her to church. And when I told her about our young adult group, she got very excited. Folks, we need a community. If you don't have one, you need to find one. We need a body of believers. So Daniel didn't panic. He stayed in control. He discovered the facts. He went home and he found his friends and they prayed together. How important is that? There is a supernatural synergy in prayer when you join together with other believers. Look at verse 18. That they might, this is their prayer, seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So notice, Daniel's first response is to go to prayer. It's not his last resort. I kind of get that from people. I say, well, let's pray about it. And they say, has it come to that? You know, we've lost every other possibility, so now we're going to pray. I mean, what do you do when you're under pressure? What's the first thing you turn to? I I said that in the first service and all kinds of people answered. Somebody said Google. (laughs) And so many people do that. And that's okay if you're trying to get stains out of your shirt. But when it comes to the big issues of life, Google doesn't have the answer. There's not even a YouTube video for some things. You've got to turn to the Lord. You've got to get your focus on him. And notice what they do. They appeal to the mercies of God. Folks, we all need God's mercy. None of us deserve the least of his benefits. It's his mercy. Mercy actually is a covenant term. We have a covenant with God, and he shows us his covenant mercies. So they go to him in prayer. And what are they praying? Well, probably something very much like James 1.5. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally and upbraids not, and it'll be given him. They need wisdom they don't have. They need knowledge that isn't theirs. They need understanding that they can't get any other place. So they go to the Lord in prayer. Look at verse 19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel, and I love the phraseology, in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now, I think if Daniel had gone to sleep that night, he would have had a night dream, but he didn't. It's a night vision. And you know why I think that is? Because Daniel was under so much pressure. 
and so much strain that even though he was praying and he was trusting God, he couldn't sleep. Have you been there? I've certainly been there. Daniel was a human being. He was an amazing man of God, but he was a human being. And God responds to him with a night vision. Look at uh, verse 19 or 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now, this is the second half. First, they seek the Lord, and then they begin to thank him in advance for the answer. You know, they had the revelation. They had the wisdom now. They knew what to do, but now they've got to go do it. I know for me, I had an experience very much like this. I was in a pressure situation. This was years ago when we were pastoring another church, and I had a staff member who did some things I wasn't aware of or chose not to be aware of. And later on, they came back to cause me a tremendous amount of trouble, put me in a great amount of pressure, and I didn't know what to do. So I went to bed that night, and it was as if a hammer hit a bell when I woke up. My mind was racing. I knew I'm not going to sleep the rest of the night. So I decided to get up and I began to seek the Lord and I began to pray and I prayed in the spirit and I sought God and I asked God to give me wisdom and revelation. And suddenly it was like a vision, but it wasn't. It was a download from heaven. And I received information First of all, showing me what had happened, because I didn't quite know what happened, and revealing to me where I'd made mistakes, which I needed to repent of, and then God began to show me how to deal with it, what to do, and how to go forward. I got so excited, I just began to praise and worship God. In fact, a holy laughter came over me, it felt like. I began to laugh and just holler and praise God. And Kelly came downstairs and she said, what in heaven's name is going on? And I told her, God has spoken to me and I know the answer. So I know what's going on with Daniel. God has shown him. Nothing has changed yet, but he's worshiping God because God has given him the answer. And what we see in verses 20 to 22 has been called Daniel's psalm. You know, there's many psalms. David wrote many psalms. This is Daniel's psalm. Verse 20 says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. I love that. God raises up kings and he pulls them down. There's some things that are absolutely out of our control but we can trust God. We can believe God depending on his power. Verse 22, he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. You need not fear the darkness if you simply run to the light. And God is that light. He's the light in the middle of darkness. When we don't know what to do, when we're confused, when we don't have the strength, we can turn to him. And God reveals his secrets to those who are in covenant with him. Verse 23 says, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. He's praising God, recognizing that this didn't begin with him. That it's the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, even David, because he was of noble blood. And I want you to see this. He is praising and he is thanking God, recognizing that this is part of God's redemptive plan. That it didn't start with him and it's not about him. It's about what God is wanting to do in this situation. So he's praising God for it. Verse 23 again said, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. Verse 23 goes on. You have given me wisdom and might. You have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demands. Notice the we and the us. This is an answer to their corporate prayer. There is tremendous power in praying together. Verse 24, therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and he said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. I mean, it could be right then people are dying in their homes. Take me before the king and I will tell the king the interpretation. So here's the fourth key when the pressure's on in Babylon, act boldly. 
Now notice, God showed them what to do. God gave them the answer, but then they had to act. I got to tell you my own experience. God showed me exactly what to do. It was a revelation of God. I'm praising and worshiping him. I feel so powerful and anointed and excited. And then I wake up the next morning and have to go do it. And suddenly I don't feel so anointed. Suddenly it doesn't seem like such a great idea, but I knew it was God's idea. So I had to go out and walk out everything God told me to do. And it's so amazing how everything worked out spectacularly amazing beyond my wildest hopes, dreams, and imaginations. And when it was all done, I remember just talking to the Lord during the day, how you sometimes do. And I said to him, Lord, this was such an anxious, uptight thing, yet it all worked out so brilliantly. I don't understand why I was so uptight. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly in my spirit and said, it's because you didn't trust me. Okay, some of you are, are not thinking good of me right now, but you've done the same thing. I know how some of you are. You come to church on Sunday, the Spirit of God is moving. Maybe you've come to the altar, receive prayer, and, and you just feel the anointing. And you're ready to make changes, and you're ready to see things change, and you've heard from God, and then you go home, and, and you just don't feel the anointing anymore. I know how that works. All of us are subject to that. But you've got to do what God tells you to do, and you need to act boldly. And that's what Daniel and his friends do. Look at verse 25. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king. Quickly. People are dying. He needs to go. Verse 25 goes on and said thus to him, I found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Notice, I have found. (laughs) He didn't do much but just have a conversation with Daniel. And now he's going, but I want you to see, he must, Daniel must have had so much certitude and so much credibility that he's able to go to the king and say, he's going to give you the interpretation. His own life's on the line, but he's so confident in Daniel. Verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, and what we're going to see here is the king isn't quite as enthusiastic or certain as Ariok is. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, that's his Chaldean name, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? I can hear the skepticism in Nebuchadnezzar's voice. I mean, all of these paid wise men and Chaldeans didn't have the answer. And here's this 20-year-old slave from Judah standing in front of me, and he's supposed to have the answer. Verse 24. Verse 27, rather, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. (laughs) I love that. None of these guys can pull this off. You know, Daniel's explaining because he's setting something up here. And that is that only God can do it. And I think he says it very quickly knowing Nebuchadnezzar's mindset right then. Verse 28, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dreams and the vision of your head upon your bed were these. And next time we get together to discuss this chapter, we're going to go through this vision. It's quite extraordinary. It is one of the most amazing prophetic visions and dreams in all of the Bible. We'll be getting to that. But here's my final observation from the passage, final key and principle when you're under pressure in Babylon, and that is to deflect the honor. Deflect the honor. Don't take all the glory yourself. In fact, a lot of us want to hang on to some of the glory, but God says just deflect it. You can't handle it, so give it away. First of all, we're going to see later on that he commends Hananiah Azariah and Mishael is part of this, but primarily he's giving glory to God. There is a God in heaven who does this. It wasn't me. I want to make sure you understand, King. It wasn't me who did this. There is a God in heaven. He gets all the glory. He gets all the honor. He gets all the praise. God's the one that gives insight and wisdom and revelation and comfort and strength and provision and creativity and favor. And we need all those things. And when he does give it, we need to give him the glory. I love Psalm 23. Of course, many of you do, but you know how it starts. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I think it's the New Living Translation that says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's everything that I need. So here's what I want to say. 
I know there are people listening to me today that are under pressure. You're in situations where you don't know how to handle it. Life is tough. You don't have the answers. It looks really, really bad. But let me tell you, God is your answer. God can do what man cannot do. God can give you what you need when you don't have it. You say, Pastor, how can you be so certain? Because we all had a need that was so much bigger than us. It's called sin. We'd all sinned. We'd all fallen short of the glory of God. We were eternally separated from God. In fact, our plight was far worse than I could ever explain on my own. So let me turn to the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, beginning in verse 1, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Did you realize that was your condition? You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. You were just flowing with the course of the world and the world system. According to the prince of the power of the air, you were operating under demonic influence. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. You were a disobedient person. You were obedient to the powers of darkness, not to God. Among whom also we were all once conducting ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. You were controlled by the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You deserve the wrath of God. Folks, you were in a predicament you couldn't solve. You were in a mess you could never get out of. You were in a scrape there's no way to figure out until you come to verse 4 and you read, but God... Did you hear that? But God. Don't look to yourself. It wasn't you. Don't look to your accomplishments. Don't look to the works that you accomplished. It was all God. But God. And let me tell you today, some of you are right there. That relationship looks over. But God. It looks like they're going to foreclose on your house. But God. You don't know how you're going to pay the bills. But God. God, you don't know if you can survive this particular physical examination because you know there are issues, but God, you don't know how you're going to get out of that situation, but God, but God, but God, I want to let you know today, but God, but God, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We were done, but God, but God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for every person in this auditorium. I don't care where they're at, what they're facing, what they're going through. We have a big God who has a big butt right in the middle of their situation. It looks hopeless, but God. It looks impossible, but God. It looks like it's over, but God. Father, we thank you that you are the God who is more than enough for anything we face. And I pray for every person under the sound of my voice who's in a pressure-packed situation. And I pray that you would be their wisdom, you would be their strength, you would be their healer, you would be their deliverer, you would be their provider, you would be everything that they need as they look to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.